you can't replace part of the brain. Like, you can't. Treat them the same. A source of truth for the medtech industry. Coexists with the province. This robot understands things automatically. Number one show in the medtech industry. So Stryker got ahead of that and changed in the 90s, built a billion dollar company that helped a pie. A lot of things. The state of medtech with your host, Omar M. Khatib. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Really excited about today's guest as, you know, one of the things we love to do on the State of MedTech is celebrate great clinicians. And of course, physicians are very busy. They're very hard to uh, schedule some time with. And so particularly today's guest, uh, in my opinion, I think the opinion of many people, today's guest is probably the most well-known and well-respected spine surgeon in the world today. And that's Dr. Lawrence Lanky. For those of you who are new to spine, let me tell you a little bit about Lawrence Lanky. And of course, if you're in the spine world, everybody knows Lanky based on the Lanky classification for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, among many other things. So Dr. Lanky is a surgeon in chief at the Daniel and Jane Ox Spine Hospital in New York, Presbyterian and Allen Hospital, as well as the professor and chief of spinal surgery and chief of spinal deformity surgery at Columbia University Department of Orthopedic Surgery. To give you a little bit more color, Dr. Lanky is, as mentioned, a world-renowned surgeon for the surgical treatment of pediatric and adult patients with various forms of spinal deformity. And has a lot of expertise that are ranging from the more straightforward to the more complex deformity scene. So for his entire 28-year career, he's really focused on his efforts uh, around optimizing the safe correction of various spinal deformities in thousands of patients that he's treated, not to mention, of course, the hundreds of fellows that he's trained. Thus, he is the leading authority on such spinal deformities such as scoliosis, kyphosis, Kyphoscoliosis, flat back syndrome, high grade spondylolisthesis, failed spinal deformity surgery, needing revision surgery, and major coronal and sagittal malalignment imbalance. Again, to say that this is why I say he's probably the most well known and well respected spine surgeon in the world. In addition, of course, to this extremely busy clinical practice, his prolific academic research has culminated in nearly 500 peer review publications, 900 academic society presentations, as well as presiding as chair of over 100 spinal surgery courses worldwide. It's pretty much in, you know, I would say unmatched by any deformity surgeon in the world. Thus, his clinical and academic productivity has led to the innovative and safe treatments, both for his own patients as well as many others globally. So for this episode, I want to have him on not just to talk about the current state of spine surgery and his thoughts on innovation, but the real making of a spine surgeon, because with somebody of such a, a caliber, they're going to have a very specific way of how they think about doing surgery, how do you prepare for surgery, et cetera. So we get into that. So whether you're a med rep or in this case, a lot of medical residents, fellows, and surgeons, you'll learn a lot from this episode. Something I do want to point out is Dr. Lanky has a uh, presentation coming up at the POSNA conference, which uh, stands for the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. And he's giving a talk specifically on development and life balance, right? And mindset of what it is to be a spine surgeon. We're going to try and work with POSNA to get that episode to you guys on the show. This episode, you will be able to unlock a CME credit from this. So if you are interested in that, go and click the show notes below and unlock that CME credit. And for those of you who are med tech companies, and let's say you have a KOL, you want to have present, maybe do a live stream webinar and focus on a specific topic around your technology or your disease, please reach out to the state of med tech. We love doing episodes like this. This episode is not sponsored by any company, by the way. I just want to make that very clear. This is sponsored, if anything, by the state of med tech. But if you're a company that's looking to do those kind of things, we do a great job. We love doing live streams and we are masters at media production. Please reach out to us or go to my website, katibandco.com. And finally, if you are a startup medical device company or even a more established one, and you use Salesforce, let's face it, using, um, using the right type of tools is very important. Getting the right data in is valuable, right? That's why I partnered with Clary. Clary is essentially an AI company that focuses on revenue intelligence. And what do they do? What they do is they take your existing Salesforce CRM and they do a couple of big things. One, they automate the data going in. So that way your reps who are busy out in the field, maybe they get their Salesforce data in at the end of the day or many times at the end of the week, in which case the data is no longer accurate. They automate that data going in and then they plug into your Salesforce to help provide predictable pipeline and revenue. That way revenue collaboration is across organization. You're able to see which deals you should focus on, which ones you should not, so on and so forth. So to learn more about them, go to clary.com, that's C-L-A-R-I 
Com. And lastly, my other partners, Alpha Sophia. When it comes to using databases to identify surgeons, their procedure volumes, CPT codes, and more, it's so important. Even for this show, we do that. And of course, for my clients who we do commercial engagements for to drive sales and outbound interest, we use Alpha Sophia. So, what do I love about Alpha Sophia? A couple things. Number one, very simple and easy to use. The data is very good. They include things such as social media handles, contact information, procedure volumes, even open payments information. So, you know, which physicians are essentially uh, involved with which industry partners. But more importantly is that they're made for startups. Alpha Sophia starts at $300 a month compared to other databases that cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. $300 a month is something that's affordable for any. So if you're interested to learn more about Alpha Sophia, go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar and get three free searches. Okay, so with that being said, let's get on our episode with Dr. Larry Lenke. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show and uh, very excited because, you know, we were trying to coordinate and of course, with a busy surgery schedule, we had to move the time a few uh, a few times. But somebody who doesn't need uh, much introduction, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Larry Lenke, esteemed spine surgeon, joining us for the show today. We got a lot of great topics to, to talk about. Dr. Lenke, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And it's a Friday before a holiday weekend and... Uh... Uh, I've got this weekend uh, kind of chill out and uh, get some academic work done. So it's it's all good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, look, you know, a, a lot of people had requested uh, me to have you on the show. And so I'm happy we're able to make it work. And more importantly, I mean, with your uh, clinical calendar and your your fellows and everything, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were able to spend time with us. I want to remind our clinical audience that, again, this is a CME episode. So when you finish listening to this episode, Click the link in the show notes below and take a few seconds to write down what you learned. That's a free CME, so make sure you take advantage of it. So, Dr. Lange, let's let's start out before we start really talking shop. Um, I want to know who is who is who is Larry Lanky? You know, where did you grow up? And more importantly, of all the specialties, how did you pick spine surgery? So Larry Lenke uh, grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago, and those who know, who know the Chicagoland area. You'd rather be from the north side than the south side. The south side is kind of the tough side. Um, you know, neither one of my parents uh, have a college degree. They're both high school graduates. Uh, went easy to work right after high school, and they got married right after high school. Um, so I was the first one in my family to go to college. Uh, so I, you know, kind of grew up maybe with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder uh, and a lot of expectations from my family that I do well with life because I was afforded opportunities that they didn't have, honestly. Um, and it's all good. I was very fortunate to go to Notre Dame for college. And if you grow up Catholic in the Chicago area, at least back in the 60s, 70s, Notre Dame's kind of your dream school. And I was really fortunate to get uh, into Notre Dame. Interestingly enough, my freshman year roommate ended up being the class valedictorian, a pre-med with me. And so I kind of just did what he did. I didn't. I had no idea you know, the, how smart he was or how good of a student he was, but I, uh, I kept up with him pretty closely uh, all four years, and that allowed me to go to Northwestern Med School, so stayed in Chicago. And um, uh, I honestly thought I'd be in the Chicagoland area for forever, potentially. I, um, going through my uh, vocations in medical school, um, uh, I got first exposed to spine surgery when I did a rotation at a Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital as a, as a a senior medical student uh, doing an outside rotation, and I got put on uh, a very famous scoliosis surgeon service named Dr. Ronald DeWald, uh, one of the founding members of the Scoliosis Research Society, uh, probably uh, in his era trained more spine fellows than anyone, uh, probably close to 100. Um, he trained my main mentor in St. Louis, Dr. Keith Gridwell, and, and um, so I basically spent a month on his service, and at the time, you know, he was doing these, what I thought, just uh, unbelievably complex scoliosis surgeries, uh, a lot from the back. But also at the time, a lot of these were done from the front to a large uh, anterior incision where you went into someone's chest. You kind of pushed the heart lungs out of the way to get to the spine or, or you went into their belly, pushed the retroperitoneal out of the way, the abdominal contents out of the way to get to the spine. And boy, this is real surgery. I mean, I, as someone who actually initially thought I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, when I got exposed to that, I, I liked the idea that it was kind of real surgery, but a combination of a little bit of um, kind of push and shove and la, la, uh, kind of more gross movements, but also obviously around the spinal cord and mirror is very fine. So it's kind of emphasized both aspects of uh, of, uh, of surgical skills, in other words. Um, there's some areas like orthopedic surgery, you just kind of hammer things in, right? 
Uh, and some things like hand microsurgery where you're using absolute finest touch you can, right? And spine surgery kind of encompasses all that. So I kind of, that's really initially why I got intrigued by spinal surgery. But I want to give credit to Ron DeWald uh, at Rush Press St. Luke's. So he's actually still alive and still a friend of mine. And you know, oh, he was, uh, was a great mentor of mine and has always been throughout my entire career. Fantastic. You know, I was going to ask you, like, on the cardiothoracic side, because at that time they may have been towards the end of their career, but, like, one of the storied rivalries in, in, in surgery was the uh, debakey cooley rivalry. Did that have any influence of, like, you having an interest to say, like, oh, let me go into cardiac surgery? Because that was those were really exciting times back then. Yeah, well, back, you know, again, back in the 60s and 70s, real surgeons were cardiac CT surgeons. I mean, they, they were known as a real surgical specialty, right? But honestly, what happened was the same time that I kind of did this rotation – at Rush with Dr. DeWald, I think my next rotation actually was out of the CT service at Northwestern when I was, where I went to medical school. And honestly, the trainees were miserable. So uh, the fellows, you know, they never left the hospital. This is back in the mid eighties where, you know, they just got beat up. They never left the hospital. Um, uh, you know, they were treated very well. You know, they're really hardworking, great. But honestly, the, the work ethic didn't really scare me. I, I, I'm not, I'm fine with working hard, but, uh, but, they, you know, they just really didn't enjoy what they were doing. That really worried me. I don't, I don't think that changed either. It's it's a right. it's, it's a rough specialty with like really high divorce rates. There's um there I think there's a fellowship program out in the uh, northeast. I can't remember where. Um, but they called uh the the attending or uh was his name first name was Dave, but they called it a decade with Dave because essentially the divorce rates like people got remarried like twice and it was just really, really rough. But yeah, CT surgery for some reason is like that spine, yeah. it, even though it's equally as long and difficult for some reason, not the same way. I yeah, don't know. I'm not sure. And the other thing interesting or that happened was uh, one of the fellows, I, I don't remember his name. I wish I would, but um, uh, was telling me that he was getting uh, uh, some word about some European investigators that were trying to do things in the heart through the veins of the legs i.e. what's what you know as you know that's revolutionized ct surgery right it's taken away a big portion of ct surgery uh doing angioplasties doing things you know uh uh, uh through uh, vessel cannulation and so he was really worried that you know, that may change the specialty and guess what it totally did so i think i made an absolutely uh, terrific decision in, in hindsight to focus on complex spine surgery and not ct surgery let me let me ask you so i'm just always curious so for me you know my my background my father i grew up with a uh, father who's a general surgeon who uh coincidentally he trained at rush you know oh, really? yeah he trained trained at rush and it's funny um i have uh, probably i feel like rush is such a historic place there's always like books on it so i think i have like a number of books just about the history of surgery at rush um and then really? my yeah, it was a really, really historic program. And then myself, I I was in medical school down in Texas. I decided to leave about halfway through, um, right before my step one. The reason why I ask ask I wanted to bring that up is that for my father and also for myself, when you're going through medical school and training, you have an idea of what you want to do. But what I always seem to hear, and it seems to be a heuristic that proves true, which is you end up falling in place in the specialty that your personality fits the best. Do you, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, to some extent. I mean, I, I think, again, um, I, uh, I, I was attracted to this field because I thought it was, number one, real surgery. I wanted to be a real surgeon. Um, uh, you know, again, in orthopedics at the time, orthopedic training, well, there's a lot of arthro arthroscopic surgery, which is great if you're a patient. I mean, but I didn't want, I call it video game surgery, and that's fine. I, I mean, I, people are stuck at that, you know, the after Chris Amato to carry my shoulder arthroscopically, God bless him. I mean, I, you know, versus of having an open surgery, but I wanted to be a real surgeon. And I, and this afforded me, you know, especially focusing on spinal deformity surgery is, is still real open surgery. It's real surgery, real risk, real benefits. Um, and then uh, I'm spending all day there. And also, I think it kind of is a culmination of my uh, interest uh, as, a, as a young person in both staying in shape. And also I played a lot of chess uh, and, you know, doing 10 hours straight of, of spine surgery really requires you to be in pretty good shape, both physically and mentally, and to be able to focus on what you're doing, but also be three steps ahead, like chess. And so I think you're right. I mean, honestly, my background kind of set me up for uh, being a successful spinal deformity surgeon. So in that, in that respect, you're spot on. Huh? Fantastic. Yeah, and I, I had seen that in one of your previous interviews that, like, uh, you know, uh, for me, I, I recently got into chess just the last few years, and I have a young son, and he, you know he's going to get into it as well. Um, great sport. Yeah, it's great a great, it is, 
and and you, and I'm happy you just you said something interesting. You said it's a great sport. Something that people don't realize. Uh, so I just worked out earlier today, and pro, based on my like whoop readings, I burned about two thousand calories. They measure the amount of calories that chess players, uh, professional chess players, and grandmasters burn. Mm -hmm. On average, it's about five thousand because so much I mental. Know, you're kidding me! I'm shocked by that. Yeah, oh, because, because you're, put, you're burning, you're burning so much energy in your brain thinking. Right. And part of part of my, metabolic. you're absolutely right. That's a great. Yeah. Point. Part of my shows, I, I make a lot of good book recommendations. So one of them, uh, a great entrepreneur, Patrick Beck David, wrote this book called "Your Next Five Moves: Master the Art of Business Strategy." The whole premise of this is that just like chess, you should be thinking about your next five moves. Maybe there's a good, in, you know, segue into the making of a great spine surgeon. What is your preoperative workflow? And there's something very specific that you've been doing every single time before your cases. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So um, basically, uh, you know, all my cases start early in the morning, um, 730 in the morning, typically. So all the basically 10 to 15 minute routine that I do every single case I've done every single case for my 32 year career. And then I basically, you know, leave my emails alone, shut my phone off, basically, you know, no one can bother me. I need 10, 15 minutes, right? Or every aspect of the patient's case, the radiographs, the CT images, the MRI images. If I've created a 3D printed model uh, of a complex deformity, I will study that. Uh, again, I've already studied it once. I've studied it again. I got into a final summary um, uh, assessment and uh, review of the entire patient's uh, anatomic pathology. Uh, if I need to figure out, you know, again, was she complaining of left leg pain or right leg pain? I'll, I have the note in front of me. So I have all the information I need to go into surgery knowing everything about that patient that I can. I know that patient as, as well as they know themselves, basically, from a spine perspective. And I, uh, I've done that my entire career, and it served me well. I mean, it doesn't you, know, you got to be in the habit of doing that. But once you get in the habit, uh, it's, it's quite easy. And uh, for me, honestly, I, you know, maybe once or twice for some reason I got, you know, I get stuck on calls or Zooms that run late and I have a hard time getting the ten, uh, 10 minutes I need or whatever, but uh, I, I feel lost. If I don't have a, my full time, I feel more lost than you are. I don't like it. And sometimes I actually will kind of go back to my office and have even sort of start a little later just to make sure I'm mentally prepared for what I'm going to do that day. Interesting. And you even mentioned, uh, I guess, in in, pre in previous interviews that, you know, uh, I think for some of your adult cases like you might you might have picked out that this person has kind of like a t13 or something you know and you and so with those 10 minutes a lot of times you discover new things do you think it's because of the pressure that the surgery is about to happen and maybe your mind is sort of queued up in a certain way that you're looking a little with a little bit more intensity than previous what why do you think that that 10 15 minutes is so so special oh yeah the, the adrenaline's running i mean it's, it's showtime right the showtime's coming soon you know guys study i start studying my patients it depends on the complexity of the case often several months in advance, just on a more peripheral level. But, you know, when it's 10, 15 minutes before I'm going to the OR, that, that's game time, right? Uh, probably similar to athletes, you know, before a, a, a big game. I mean, you know, you're getting your body ready, but there's nothing like those last 10, 15 minutes because the adrenaline starts flowing. Cortisol level, I'm sure, is higher. And uh, and I got to get everything, uh, you know, perfected before I go to the OR. And I'm, and I'm set to deliver the best care possible to my patient. You know, that patient's depending on me, right? If patients put their life in my hands the next uh, sometimes 12 hours if it's a really complex all day reconstruction right so uh my goodness if that was if that were me going having that surgery i want the surgeon to do the same thing right i mean that's that's a big deal so i i understand the the uh importance i understand the gra gravity of the situation and that's what i think drives me to uh to perform like that to, to prepare to perform in other words right Absolutely. You know, I want to go back real quick, you know, to your time as a resident fellow, especially with Dr. Dewall and some of your other mentors, you know, part of the residency, as I, you know, I hear from my father is it's very much like military training. They, they mop the floor with you and it's brutal, especially back then because they didn't have uh, all these new rules of oh, residency and everything, you know, like, you know, it was brutal. My, my father, even, I think he was, uh, he was so tired one day that like he, he got on an accident on the way home. And by the time, like, Things were sorted out with the police and everything. He actually had to head back to the hospital. So back then, when you're under that pressure cooker, um, some of your attendings, your mentors, told you told you things. What was the most painful thing that one of those people told you that changed you for the better as a spine surgeon? Uh, the first patient that had a postoperative paralysis, I called actually Doctor Rawl. I called several senior surgeons about it to you know to make sure I was had done everything right and. And everything and um uh and basically you know he told me kind of welcome to 
the real world of, uh, of a complex spine surgeon, Larry, this is kind of the way it is. You're going to have these situations every now and then. You got to learn how to deal with this. Otherwise, you're not going to succeed. It's going to it's going to drive you drive you away from the specialty. So you got to somehow figure out how you're going to handle these adverse events. Thankfully, they're far and few between, but they do they happen anyway. If they don't happen, you're, you're not doing enough spine surgery, or enough complex spine surgery, right? That's the that's the thing that really is frustrating. Honestly, that's Kind of, and I've known, learned that even through training, and now obviously my entire practice is that you can do an absolutely perfect technical surgery, and the patient doesn't do well. And, uh, and sometimes we don't. Under, and, and the most frustrating thing is when you don't understand why. And that, and that's because you know the body is not a machine. You know, we deal with uh, spines that are connected to brains that are connected to neurons that sometimes process things and signals and pain differently and. It's very frustrating when uh, when you do what you think is a technically perfect surgery and and things don't work out well. You have a complication, or the patient just says it, it isn't a success, and that's really frustrating. And I, you know, so that's you know, learning how to handle that adversity. Honestly, is I think one of the things that you have to learn as as, a, as a, any kind of surgeon, but especially a spine surgery, because that's going to happen. Uh, that's really frustrating. Um, so it's still these things still bug me today. I mean, I had a complication like this on a patient six months ago and it's still I, I think about it every day still it's really frustrating yeah and you know on on the on the flip side of that sometimes you know and uh the orthopedic community has become uh more pr uh, prevalent and active on linkedin like posting cases having these discussions and this is a, a case i was posted i think maybe a few months ago by the, uh russell bodner out of northwestern who said like this you know the imaging of this does not look like a great surgery at all the, uh, you know, the outcome actually turned out really, really well. And so I think this is where that, yeah, yeah exactly. With all the technology we've had and everything, um, surgery is becoming more and more like a science, but there's still this element of art where like, you just don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. Right. The artistry, uh, you know, I grew up where surgery was more of an art. It's definitely becoming more of a science and it, and it definitely needs to change to absolutely more of a science. It's more reproducible, right? Both in its uh, technical considerations and its outcomes. But uh, you're right. I mean, the, the artistry of surgery is still something, and that goes even down to patient selection and uh, and uh, the picking out the right surgery and obviously performing the right surgery and and, and alternating, you know, and like going down pathway B instead of pathway A because in surgery pathway A is not you know producing uh, the, the results you want. So there's a lot of that that still is involved. And that's why I think it's going to be a bit of time before we have kind of robots and technicians kind of doing all this or AI kind of doing all this for us. I mean. Maybe in more simple things that would be more automated, but I think um, you know the more complex the situation, I think the, the more difficult it's going to be. I think to kind of just rely solely on scientific methods, AI, machine learning, and things to kind of give reproducible results. But it's slowly going to help. It's definitely going to help uh, all of us, including the most senior surgeons. But I think it's going to be a little slower to I think help as much as people think in those most complex situations and patients. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, the art and science of surgery is really all about nuance. And at least for me, I feel that as more technology comes out, it sort of helps cover the areas that, you know, you're not going to get as many surprises. That way, the surgeon can spend more time and focus, focusing really on the nuance instead of the whole spectrum of the surgery. Yeah, really looking at. I agree. Yeah. And also, the goal is to make, let's face it, I've trained over 130 fellows. I mean, I, they're all wonderful, but they're, everyone has different skill sets, right? And so, the the advance the advances especially with enabling technologies in the surgical theater are going to basically kind of make a more consistent surgeon right so even surgeons who aren't as skilled as some will have a more level playing field of technical execution right so that's going to be better for everyone so that's why I'm really sure. excited about the future because that needs to happen right because everyone's got different skill sets not not everyone can be at the one percentile of surgical skill, right? Um, so that's going to be a leveling playing field for that. Something, you know, something I wanted to ask you, like, again, when it comes to like the making of a, of a spine surgeon is, I think something that people don't realize or they don't think about is like being a surgeon is very much like being a top performing a athlete. So like your fitness level, your nutrition, your sleep, like all these things matter. I want to start with something that I don't think I hear anybody really talk about, which is at this point in your career, you have for the most part, pretty strong control of your, of your calendar. How did you, how do you set up your week between when you're performing surgery and when you're seeing patients versus when you're doing research uh, and, and why, you know, I mean, literally if you can get down to the granular fact of like, what do you prefer to have, have on Mondays as opposed to Fridays? Yeah. So, um, I'll tell you my schedule, you're right. I do control my schedule. I've controlled it, uh, for a long time now. So Monday basically is my big surgery day. So I'm, you know, I've rested, I've had, you know, unless I'm, 
even if I've traveled, I'm still, I haven't done surgery Saturday and Sunday. I, I, mean, I don't, I'm, I don't take call anymore, so I don't have to do weekend surgeries. I did in past, obviously, but I'm at the point in my career now after 32 years, right? I don't have to take weekend call and do weekend surgery. So I'm more we I'm well, well rested Monday morning. So I love to do my biggest case on Monday, which it is. So I'm in OR all day Monday. Typically, that's my 10 to 12 hour case, uh, my long case of the week. Um, and then uh, Tuesday is another surgery day, but usually a, a slightly lighter case, um, uh, maybe six, seven, eight hour case uh, in most, uh, sometimes another 10, 12 hour. That's pretty rare. I try and, you know, again, I, I, I try not to do that. With my scheduling, since my, my cases are elective, you know, I, I won't put back to back horrendous cases because I, I want to be as, uh, as fresh for Tuesday's case is Monday's case. And so if it's if Tuesday's is another very challenging case, I'll put it the following Monday or whatever. So I you you space up in challenging cases. Yeah, very challenging. Now, and then Wednesday is my uh, either uh, patient office day to give me a break or an academic day. Um, so I see patients two and a half times a month now. So first and third Monday, th Wednesday, I see patients all day long. And then the second or fourth Wednesday, I see patients half a day just a post-op office. Um, uh, so those are my, honestly, that's my day where you know, seeing patients, obviously, it's a lot easier than doing surgery. And so uh, that's my also, that's my evening I meet with my trainer. So Wednesday evening, I meet with my trainer after office. Uh, I, I train usually twice twice a week, Wednesday and Friday. So Wednesday after surgery, excuse me, after office is a, is a perfect time for me to, to train. And then Thursday, I, I'm, I operate again, but on children. Uh, and so my case Thursday can be complicated as well. And that's fine because I've had Wednesday, you know, I've had a break Wednesday. So even if I have a complex case Thursday, I've had a break to be able to be in good enough um, mental, physical shape to do a really tough case on Thursday if necessary. Now, Friday, as I told you earlier, is kind of my administrative academic day, um, meeting day, and uh, and recovery day as well. So an often travel day for meetings. You know, a lot of our meetings are Friday, Saturday. So so that's my week. It's It's been like that for uh, uh, almost nine years now. And um, But there's a reason why I do that. You know, two days OR break and then Thursday uh, vacation so I can operate three full days a week. And, um, and I, and I, and even at my age, I feel like on today, Friday, I've, I've had a, the same week this week. And I feel pretty good right now. I mean, it's for the Friday afternoon and, and I don't feel completely beat up. And, um, uh, uh and also things have gone well this week. That's another thing. Things go well. It's, it's a good week. Glad I'm catching and, it. And going back to the point of you know, doing a technically perfect <laughs> surgery and that things not going as well. It's like those are the weeks that are really frustrate themselves. So like, uh, overall, I think, um, now, sending up your schedule, level, or sending up your schedule to succeed is really important. When you're now sometimes you don't have that luxury when you're a junior surgeon, you kind of have to kind of take all of the block time when you are that is assigned to you. But kind of thinking about it over time as you get more uh, um, uh, uh, experience and, uh, and more um, leverage with your can position wherever you are to try to figure out what's best for you and with not only your surgical schedule but your family schedule and uh, everything else. Like, like when I was in St. Louis. Um, you know, Tuesday night uh, was family night. So because Tuesday night was my easier OR day, Tuesday night, basically, uh, I was always home uh, by 6 o'clock. Uh, you have family dinners. Uh, every Tuesday night, I was the only night of the week I was home by 6. So but I made it a, 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 a definite a plan that I would always be home. And so the kids could always, and my wife could always know that I'd be home for dinner on Tuesday night. So plan for your family, plan for yourself, plan to keep yourself healthy. This is a marathon, not a sprint, right? So you got to plan for that. No, absolutely. And I'm happy you mentioned that because I think, you know, when you think about science, science has always been like mankind's pursuit of controlling the environment and everything around. But I think as an individual, we don't put enough time and, you know, pun intended, you know, into thinking about how do we control our time as we get more control over it. And I think this is one area where whether it's a surgeon or even a, a professional I talk to, I look at their schedule and, I'm, and I can tell like there's not been a, enough thought put into when am I most optimal, when am I best. Um you know, this is kind of a little bit granular, but I, I'm just very curious. Morning time before surgery, you eat a big breakfast. Do you drink coffee? What's what's your routine like? Yeah, oh, it's all it's all routine. Uh, uh, basically, jug of coffee, probably two cups, really strong coffee. I love really strong coffee, black, uh, and basically a bagel with you have a grinder. You got whole bean coffee? Yep. Oh yeah, whole bean coffee uh, grinder, um, and um, with the. Uh, uh, Basically, a bagel with peanut butter and a banana, and I'm good to go until dinner, basically. Um, or honestly, when I get out of the OR late, I'll, I'll have a Quest bar. I'll have some type of nutrition bar, basically, uh, but not anything big because number one, I'm not hungry after I get out of surgery. To tell you the truth, uh, but by the time I get home then for dinner, which is usually sometime between seven to nine o'clock at night, then I'm ravenous and I'll eat a big dinner. But that's how my my day. I've, I've had that's 
that kind of schedule for a long time, a decade. So it works for me, it works for my body. And so I'm not changing now, I can tell you. So it works. We you know we, um, something that uh, I think a lot of people uh, don't realize, like historically, technically based on a number, like you probably trained the most people in, in history, technically. You, at this point, you said you're, you're up to, you're, you're at one. I'm training 129th, 134th fellow this year. So, you know, I think of this, you know, so recently not, I mean, not to continue with the sports analogy, but like uh, Nick Saban, who is like the extremely famous and, oh, and I hate that he retired. That's terrible. I, was I, know, I need to, I, I really, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. He's still on top of his game. I, I, you know what? I can, I agree with you, which is that there's still a lot to him. And this is where I'm you, this year, you know, he, I saw his team play at the beginning of the year. They look bad, but he somehow at the end of the year, they look fantastic. And yeah, what? same people. That's the coaching, right? I mean, obviously there are other factors, but that I think this is one of his most successful years because he had an uphill climb. And guess what? He made that team do it, right? Do you think? Quick sidebar. I think because again, he's 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 not that old. Like I think he's maybe late fifties, maybe early sixties. I think he's late. No, no, no. So I think he's seventy-two. He's old. He's in the 70s. Oh, really? He looks great. Like, he's seventy-two. But he's still I mean, got. Don't pull me on that, but I'm. I'm Man, I'm completely him and Belichick. I know they're both up there, but I, I think uh, he's in the late sixties, early seventies. Do you think he's taking a break and maybe he's gonna tr he's gonna try one more uh, one more time to get uh, to get into the NFL? Uh, you know, I, I have no idea. But if he does that, he needs to get pretty soon because time's a wasting. Let's face it, yeah. any younger. So if I was if I was in his shoes and I had that aspiration, I'd do it really soon. Yeah, no, no, I I, I can believe. I wonder. I feel like there's some uh, parallel between. Uh, uh, specifically college football coaches and surgeons, you know, my dad was a surgeon and it just took like, you know, heaven and heaven and hell just to like, you know, get him to like, he actually didn't even retire. He, he made himself unemployable because he said, you know, he's going to be uh, taking some roles uh, as a director, uh, but only part-time like that. No one's going to hire you as a part-time medical director. And so he never really retired. He just made himself unemployable. Do you feel like surgeons, you know, and again, not to, not to critique here, but like, you know, DeBakey was like doing stuff like well into his nineties. I mean, do you feel like some surgeons don't know when it's time to hang to hang it up and retire and, and kind of transition their career? When, when's when's the right timing for that? Do you yeah, think? I've heard stories that I've heard stories of some famous spine surgeons who basically got to be told by their partners that it's time to kind of hang it up. Um, uh, you know, you don't want to get to that stage, right? Um, uh, so I uh, hopefully, um, you know, I. I I'm I'm 63 right now, Omar. So I mean, I I, I really don't have any plans yeah. right now to retire. But my dad was still love what I do. But uh, you know, I know I, I know three or four of my colleagues uh, who you know have retired already, who are my year, age or even younger than I. Uh, and my mentor Keith Bridwell, uh, who again trained me in St. Louis, so around the wall basically you know, trained Keith Bridwell. I trained with Keith Bridwell at Washington University in St. Louis. Was his first fellow, then stayed there with him for 24 years before I came to New York. Uh, yeah, he retired at my age. Um, uh, I, I just can't see that. And I still love what I do. And I think I'm still good at it. And so, uh, but you're right. I want to get to the point where people are kind of looking at, uh, and saying things, well, you know, like he's really not on top of his game anymore, especially what I do. I mean, you know, I got, it's, I think it'll become pretty obvious where uh, um, uh, that's not going to be the best situation. Because again, I, I, I really only do complex before any surgery. And, and these are really long surgeries that can go wrong can go bad it can go south pretty quickly so um uh, i i want to try and be smart about it and i've already talked to some of my junior partners and my fellows i uh, talk to the fellows all the time they you know they know i'm uh, still doing a really good job because uh, uh they love training with me still so we'll see but um i don't want to get to that point i mean i i'm, I'm aware of it and i can tell you it's not gonna happen i'm not gonna operate in my 90s i dare to you uh and i i'd love to work in my 70s we'll see i you know and part of it honestly is is what happens. I mean, you know, eyesight goes, and I got a little bit of arthritis in my hand or something. You know, things often that I think are, are going to get in the way, even if I wanted to operate way late in my life, that it's, it's just not going to happen. There's a lot of wear and tear for what I do as a surgeon as well, and joints and everything. And stress, and you mentioned that, and the stress is, is real. Uh, as you know, so um, I've been fortunate that uh, everything's kind of fallen in place. And uh, uh, with my family, I've still married my wife 35 years now, this May. I mean, I, you know, I've had a really fortunate life that. Everything's fallen in place to allow me to kind of continue on this pace for 32 consecutive years. That doesn't happen to everyone. I've known some really talented surgeons who get sidetracked or derailed by family issues or health issues or whatever. I've been really fortunate and 
and just thankful to God for that because that's that's beyond my control. Some of that, right? I mean, it sounds like uh, you know, uh, it, 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 just in in my observation, it sounds like a good reason for that was you you know early in your career and part of your success was that you know you did a high high volume of complex deformity early in your career. And you just you just took advantage of that at the beginning of your career when you had the energy, you had the time and everything, but you were very intentional about your time, time with family. And it was kind of more of a holistic approach versus a lot of times, I think, you know, entrepreneurs do this, surgeons do this, which is they go head first into the, into the craft, but you can't, you know, have all this time and focus here and then expect that, oh, I'm going to have a great marriage with my wife or good relationship with my kids. And you can't make up for that later on. So it sounds like you're very uh, intentional about where you focused your time and where you were focusing your time. There was an, an immense amount of intensity. You're right. Um, two, two comments on that. Number one is that, um, uh, you know, I always say that I'm certainly not the technically most uh, adept surgeon, spine surgeon uh, uh, in the country, but there is no one, and I mean absolutely no one, that's done more complex deformity surgery than me. And that's not bragging. That's just a fact. And that and that's so, I mean, I tell it to my patients. I mean, that the only reason you're coming to see me and you see, you know, across the country, wherever you come from, is that you, re you realize that, you know, I've just had a lot of experience doing this, but I, I put in the effort, right? So I don't, that's not, to me, that's not bragging. That's just, that's just real re reality, right? Uh, I put in the effort. You're right. I was ex very fortunate at a very young uh, surgical age to uh, 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 develop a very complex uh, spinal deformity practice. And, uh, and that was very unusual in the back of the 90s to do that. I was one of the first surgeons in the country to focus my entire practice on scoliosis and other deformities. And that, the time that was kind of unheard of. I mean, you know, people are not, not only spine surgery, but they would do orthopedic surgery and, you know, and spine surgery or spine surgery and a, or a variety of things. But I focused only on scoliosis and deformity surgery from a very early age. And that, that really helped. The second thing I want to say is that I, you know, I wasn't perfect. I mean, I, you know, my, uh, I, I did go head first a little sometimes too crazily into my craft. So I just, for everyone out there listening, my, no one's perfect. Uh, I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to give the um, uh, presidential talk at the POSNA, Pediatric Orthopedic Society North America meeting this May. Dan Sicato, who's president of POSNA, uh, asked me to be his presidential guest speaker, which I'm very indebted to him for. That's a very big honor. But my, he wants me to talk about a non-spine um, uh, surgery topic. I'm going to talk about managing the imbalance. You know, how do you manage the imbalance of being a busy surgeon, spine surgeon? And, uh, you know, and I, I'm going to be out, brutally honest. I wasn't good at it sometimes. I, I, it, it, I, it was a learning experience. I mean, I, I, we did that. I had some marital issues, issues with my wife because I wasn't around. I wasn't probably around for my children as much as I could have been sometimes. But, you know, uh, I learned uh, through that. Uh, my wife and I kind of managed it with, with the help of others, and, and I made the best of it. And honestly, now it, it, uh, it, it's better than ever. So it, it, it was challenging. I'm not going to say it was easy at all. I, mean, I, don't want, I don't want to give the false impression that I've had this gilded life that everything just kind of fell in place, and I knew everything from the beginning that I, you know, I needed to spend time at home. But I didn't know that because I, you know, I was I wanted to be the best surgeon you could. I was operating five days a week. I mean, there's no one operating on spines five days a week. I'd, I was in the OR five days a week for 15 years straight uh, when I wasn't traveling around the world. So uh, I, I, it was a challenge to manage my family and my other commitments. But uh, thankfully, my wife was very understanding. We worked it together, but we had to work at it. It wasn't easy uh, to make it work. But now, uh, you know, uh, everything's gone great. I got three wonderful grown children who love my wife and I, and uh, we're still strong. So it, it's worked out. But you got, you got to, online, you got to be dynamic. Things change, things evolve. Your marriage, you know, you change, your spouse changes, your significant other changes. You got to kind of continue to evolve and keep the lines of communication open to make the best of things because it's not easy. I, I love that. And personally, I mean, look, and I, I do want to bring this up because when I was in medical school, the funny thing was that I actually learned about you because of your uh, your lengthy classification for um, yeah. for adolescent mm -hmm. idiopathic scoliosis, right? And I remember thinking when I first read about that and I was, someone told me like, oh yeah, he's still practicing. I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean he's still practicing? Because it's kind of rare to see that. And I, I want to come to that in a second because that, that hasn't been... Um, uh, changed, you know, which is, it's really stood the test of time, which is really impressive, but I'm going to make a prediction here, which is, I think in your career, um, and, and, and your legacy, I think the thing that's going to be, that's going to last the, the test of time, um, is some of these non-clinical things like this speech you're going to give in May, because these are the things that so often are, are not talked about in, in surgery. And I think, again, surgeons are human beings, just like everybody else. 
you can't have a knockout drag out fight at home or have some imbalance in your life, both physical, mental, or spiritual, and expect that you're going to bring the best version and deliver best care to a patient. Right. And so absolutely, you're spot on there. Right? You couldn't say it better. Actually, I'm going to use that quote in my talk. Absolutely. Uh, look, and, and it's true. I'm just going to say it now because like, I want, I want to get pressure from my audience so I can follow up. If I'll, I'll try and coordinate with you. I would love to get that talk and publish it um, and promote, promote the conference and everything afterwards on the show. Yeah. So I think that's something that we really need to kind of. 2,000 people there. Yeah, it's a huge conference. It's a combination of the, of the PASNA and what's called ePASNA, which is the European section. So they expect 2,000 attendees. That's so fantastic. That's fantastic. And, and just, again, like not to put, not to, not to put pressure on you, but just think of it like this is that that talk is going to influence so many people and you're, not, you're never going to know. Like, because that's going to influence not just those 2000, but there's going to be a multiple effect of those of people when they train people, et cetera, so on and for, so forth. So I'm really I'm excited. already starting to work on it. Yeah. It's a big, 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 it's a big, you know, big honor for me to give that talk, but it's a big talk for me to give. I, I recognize the importance of it. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on it and do, do my best. That's for sure. So, uh, in line with time. And again, I, I really want to have you back. So we're going to roll through a few more things. So, um, state of spine surgery. So one of the things mm-hmm. that, um, you had talked about, uh, is your interest in AI and more importantly, developing uh, technical pathways for it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about AI and spine surgery? I mean, where do you think it can be most helpful and how are you incorporating it in your practice? Yeah, so right now um, we are, I'm not incorporating AI directly in my practice. We're doing it in research purposes. We have a, one of my um, uh, junior partners, uh, Joe Lombardi, who I was fortunate enough to train and then recruit to stay with us at Columbia in the Oxbine Hospital is working with the computer scientists in Columbia, basically on kind of data analysis and in the AI way. I mean, it's just, it's just a quick story. You know, we kind of uh, presented her, you know, let's say 500 patients each with like 200 variables of data. And, uh, you know, which for us is that's a lot of patient data. That's a lot of patients, a lot of data. And, and she laughed because that's like minuscule data, right? The AI, they work on gigabytes of data, right? So, but, uh, but you know, their, their way of analysis is, is totally different than anything we've ever been exposed to. And the, and uh, and they're basically you know just showing us from a research perspective uh, how best to analyze our patients and get the research answers that we need from hypothesis that we generate. Um, you know how that is going to translate into the clinical realm is going to be things very quickly for patient selection. In other words, you know we put in all the characteristics of the patient. The model basically says you know green, yellow, red. Green proceed with surgery. Yellow, you got to uh, optimize this patient whether it's nutritionally or uh, um, uh, exercise wise or, or laboratory wise or health wise, whatever, whatever it is before you turn green or red, that basis patients really not a good uh, candidate for having the surgery you're proposing. Um, uh, so that's going to, that's, that's going to come very soon. I see them. And then actually there's some centers, I think Chris Ames at uh, UCSF is already using things like that. You know, he's kind of, we yes. in one of the uh, uh, leaders of the field is very sharp guy. I'll mean, give credit for Chris. He's uh, really taught me a lot about this. Yeah, so that's going to be, uh, I think that's going to be germane to everyone very soon. And it should be because uh, there are patients that need optimization before surgery. Uh, not many red candidates, but there will be some. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. I mean, and, and especially with our he- healthcare economics, we need to kind of weed out who is not going to do well with surgery, especially spine surgery, because uh, the health economics are not in our favor unless we do that. Um, I'm sure you remember one. And the second thing that's going to happen, I think, to follow that is, you know, everyone has different skill sets and there's still lots of ways to do, to handle a certain uh, clinical problem. And so I think what AI will help us with is giving this patient's characteristics and giving this skill set and not only your skill set, but your OR capabilities and your assistance capabilities. What's the best surgery for this patient to have in your hands? It may be different in my hands, right? Maybe different in my hands than your hands. But I think uh, that will help uh, really kind of fine tune uh, the the surgical optimization of a patient, which should lead them to better outcomes. Absolutely, and I'm going to piggyback on the AI AI uh, section because we have a few questions. We got a lot of them, but I did my best to kind of uh, uh, card them out. So we're going to breeze through these for the next, for the last like 15 minutes. So uh, spine surgeon Dr. John Ashgar, who's down in the south. Um, yeah, has- I know John. Yeah, I know John. Great guy. Great guy. Great guy. Um, so he he actually said, look, with invent, with advances in AI and external pressures on cost control and pain physicians doing fusions, what does Dr. Lanky see for the global evolution of spine for the next five or 10 years? We got a few more to oh, go. Yeah, I, I, I think well, uh, either, either basically out of the table is going to be this patient selection criteria 
that either the surgeons better develop or the payers are going to develop for us all right i mean so i i rather i want to control that i don't want insurance companies or the or the government controlling you know the variables that we put into these algorithms to produce uh patient selection criteria so i think we need to do that as surgeons otherwise we're going to lose control of that right because the Completely payers agree. ultimately the payers are doing they're doing it now they're starting to do it now we get the aisles now not necessarily what i do but for our degenerative surgeries they they kind of tell Sur, you know, surgeons uh, uh, who, who they can operate on and, and specifically what they can do. They're really actually telling us what they can or can't do uh, through, I'm sure, automated algorithms they've already developed. So this is this is real time right now with insurance companies. But I think we as a profession need to gain control of that and, and control that and as, as we totally show. I 100% agree. And something I, I tell surgeons all the time, which is like over the last few decades, and mainly I think because of the culture of surgery is – when the business of medicine started, you know, developing more of a foothold, you know, maybe starting around the 60s or 70s, surgeons kind of said, that's not my problem. I'm just going to focus on clinical medicine. And they lost control of that. And that's kind of where Absolutely. we are now. Absolutely. AI, I feel like, is this new thing where surgeons have, to, you know, not just surgeons, physicians have to get a hold and control that. Because if they don't, insurance companies are going to. And, and, it, and it's always going to go away from the kind of medicine that physicians want to practice. So I totally agree, Omar, but the problem is that the, the deep pockets are with the insurance companies, not with the physicians anymore. So that's the dilemma. We, yeah, we, I'd like to have this done now. If I could ha hire three computer scientists, I could have algorithms developed next week. I can't afford to hire three computer scientists to do this. Insurance companies can't. So that's, that's the, the dilemma I think we are in right now is that the deep pockets are the, uh, are the payers. Uh, and so they're, you know, they have the means basically to, to figure this out and to hire people to get this done. Because we need, you know, we need expertise for this. We, I can't do this myself, right? I'm gonna, I think you're going to be the challenge of physicians you have. And I think somehow we need to, that's why I think it needs to be done at the societal level. You know, the societies have much more manpower, much more resources. And, you know, and actually industry supports our societies, you know. So that symbiosis, I think, has to be developed further to optimize how we're going to use, uh, like, AI technology to benefit our, our, you know, our, our patients, uh, so that the payers don't take control of that. I think that has to happen at the societal level. It, it's not going to happen at the position level. Physicians can't afford it. That's the problem. At least I right now. Agree. Maybe, maybe in the future that's different. But right now, 2024, it's, it's too expensive. I, I completely agree. I don't know if this is a solution, but the one thing where I'm a little bit excited about medicine, even though I, I make fun of them a lot because their first attempt was a glorious failure, but now these you know big tech like Google, Apple, Amazon, they have a fiduciary responsibility to grow. They're not going to turn around and say, hey, we're going to start making furniture. So healthcare is that thing. And their first attempt, big failure. They're making a new attempt. You know, Amazon has acquired its way in with one medical and we're seeing other companies do that. And I'm kind of hoping that these companies kind of take the side of clinicians and say, yeah, you know, what? we're going to bankroll you. And that'll kind of, you know, sort of put a more of a level playing field between clinicians and 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 payers. Because right now it's just it's just all the payers. And I mean, I don't want to get on the topic of like prior authorizations, and everything, but it's you know, it's kind of it is kind of a mess. Yeah, that, that's a great solution, though. Uh, I, I, honestly, I think uh, that's probably the best solution I've heard so far. We just need to somehow partner with these companies to to make that happen. But that that, that is an option. I mean, that's a great great point. Absolutely. All right, we're rolling through, and I'm keeping an eye on on time because I know you have a hard stop top of the hour. But if you feel like canceling that meeting and keep keep going, like <laughs> that, <laughs> that honestly, you know, you don't know what it's about, honestly, and this is why I'm not going to cancel. Huh. It's a meeting with a travel agent for my wife and I, 35th anniversary trip to Paris. Huh. So you know what? Congratulations. I'm not missing that meeting because no, I'm going to ask my wife and I'd rather have you mad at me than my wife. So no, she has totally. one. Oh, no, I, won't get mad. I don't want, I don't want Ms. Ling to be like, you're never going on Omar Khatib show. See, exactly. So I'm just being honest. I'm a transparent guy. So. <laughs> I love it. All right. So next question, um, one of my uh, good friends and, and somebody who was my one of my first managers, Sean Stewart, when we worked at Mazor Robotics, his question is, what is Dr. Lenke's outlook uh, on on uh, the on spine technology improvements for deformity in the next five to seven years? What does he feel is a need for spine deformity versus what's a want? So the need for spine deformity is number one, uh, as I mentioned, optimal patient, patient selection and technique selection. You know, uh, the patient who is best fit to have a, a, a big deformity surgery, both physically and mentally uh, and uh, emotionally, and I, all, the check, well, all the boxes are checked, right? They're optimized. And then what is the best surgery for them to have in the surgeon's hands? Because again, as I mentioned, what's best for me may not be best for surgeon X doing surgery somewhere else uh, to get the best results. So that, that, that's definitely a need. And, 
And then, and that's very realistic. You know, that's, that's intuitive, right? That, that you know, I don't, you, that's not pie in the sky stuff, right? Uh, that's going to happen. It's going to happen very soon. It's going to, obviously, that's going to be an incremental benefit in our care of our patients. From a technical perspective, you know, there is no reason why we basically can't have a, a ro robot with 36 arms that is centered over the patient and drills in accurately 36 pedicle screws in 30 seconds. That, that and replace the procedure now that takes me an hour and a half to do, right? So there's definitely technical advances that uh, we need to have happen as well. Uh, and, and what I want to have happen is from someone who's you know, put in lots of screws in my hands and have arthritis to prove it, you know, it needs to happen. Uh, and and the, the limiting factor right now, the technology is there. The issue is that two obstacles, number one, the R&D costs are so large for the industry company and our industry partners that they have a hard time investing it because the payoff isn't until later and it's a lot of money because you got to get it through the fda that's the second obstacle right but uh you know i drove you know, i have a tesla i drove my tesla down the west side highway of new york you know hands free coming home you know to have this interview what if i can do that why can't we have in a in this you know sitting in a, in a stable static environment you know 36 screws go in the spine the technology has been there for 20 years but it's not to, uh, to develop to the point the FDA gets approval. So that's what we need, stuff, stuff like that to, to make a rapid advancement in what we're doing to, you know, cut it, in it but to have an eight-hour surgery cut into two hours' time, right? And there's there's means to do that right now, but, you know, the, it, it involves, again, here's the money. It all comes back to money and the finance and who's going to pay for it um, because that's the limiting that's the limiting factor right now because health healthcare is under so much financial pressure right now. Um, uh, so that, that's my diet show. I think the easy thing is getting patient selection and individualized patient techniques. Uh, that, that's very realistic and easy, but the bigger jump and leap is going to be to have the technical components get to the point where they really should be, that this is so automated that it's happening, you know, basically real time live, uh, and in, in a fashion that cuts our surgery time by literally 90%. There's no reason that shouldn't happen. I completely agree. And I think, again, uh, being in healthcare and medicine right now, it's a really exciting time because there's a convergence of all these things. We got right. one last question. We got uh, approximately seven. We're just going to assume five minutes left. So we give you some a little bit of time to get, make your next meeting. So um, actually, uh, this is uh, one of my medical school classmates, Dr. Chester Donnelly, who's now a spine surgeon down in uh, in Dallas. Um you know, uh, ask an interesting question. He mentioned for your fellowship program that he knows that there's a lot of neurosurgeons in your program. And do you feel, does Dr. Linky feel that spine should only be a residency program? And do you feel that, um, um, you know, n as more neurosurgeons go into spine fellowship, does this change the dynamics of the field? So take that in any direction you want. Yeah, no, I, you know, again, so I've been fortunate. I trained my first neurosurgical uh, spine fellow 20 years ago, a guy named Pete Angelides. I'm my partner. He's actually my partner at Columbia now, a great, great surgeon, a uh, fantastic uh, um, person. Uh, and actually, since I've been in New York now since 2015, I've trained more neurosurgeons than orthopedic surgeons to do deformity surgery, which, would, you know, up until then was, was unheard of, right? Um, so the bottom line is, uh, you know, Who's the best spine athlete? Well, the best spine athletes who's, who has the best overall training. Right now, it's in nursery because they spend 70% of their residency training on the spine and 30% on the brain in most programs. Orthopedic surgeons spend 90% of their time in non-spine orthopedic activities and only 10% on spine at most. So coming out of residency, who's more qualified to be a spine surgeon? Right. Do you feel like it should be a residency instead of a fellowship? Oh, oh, absolutely. But the problem is the politics and again the finances because ortho and neuro don't want to lose spine surgeons because they're the money generators of both departments but it's well recognized and it's just tradition but again it's going to happen because ultimately it's better for patient care and it's better for training uh, same thing happened back in the 50s and 60s when orthopedic surgery was under general surgery right well it would never leave well it left because it was better for training and patient care takes a while. It's not going to be my lifetime, unfortunately, because I've, I've, we've been that road of trying to kind of push this a little bit and we get a lot of resistance. But I, from, from the, uh, but it's intuitive that that would be better if you decide you want to be a spine surgeon after doing a spine rotation, either as an intern or first-year resident. I'm not saying you match on a medical school to do spine surgery because a lot of medical students don't know, don't get exposed to enough spine surgery to know they want to be a spine surgeon. But within the first two years of Training, internship, and first year of residency, you, everyone does spine surgery. You need the orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery. 
then you would decide, opt out, and basically then do the rest of your training. I'd say four years is probably necessary to be a fully trained, you know, modern 2025 spy surgeon. It's uh, it's four years of complete spy training. I know that because you know we have a lot of our um, fellows now doing two fellowships, so they do you know seven years of neurosurgical residency, then two years of fellowship in spine. So nine years of training, which is way too long. They don't need all that training. If they decided to be a spine surgeon, they don't need to do brain surgery. Get out, do spine surgery, cut the training to four or five years. There's the, the savings to society is immense. And the quality imparted to the patients is even more impressive, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, how can you argue with that? You can't. The problem is, you know, it's a tradition. And again, it's the, it's a financial benefit of having spine surgeons in your orthopedic or neurosurgical department that the department chairs don't want to let go. And that's the main obstacle. And that's unfortunate because it's really not right. Fantastic. Dr. Leggy, I want to be uh, mindful of your time. And so thank you so much for coming on the show. We're going to end up having you back and definitely for your talk in May. Absolutely. I'll... Love to come back. Appreciate What's the date that. for that talk in May? And, and what was the conference again? Uh, you know, I, I, it's in May in Washington, D.C. I, I don't have the date in front of me. I think it's May 12th. I don't, I, I don't want to give you what it's sometime middle of May. It's in Washington, D.C. But it's, again, it's an annual meeting of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, abbreviated POSNA. A lot of people know POSNA in combination with the European section, which is e positive. So uh, it's in Maine, in DC, and I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Mikey, thank you so much for joining the show. I want to thank the listeners for joining again. Be sure to get your CME credit down in the show notes. I'm going to also leave some links to Dr. Linky's uh, website. This has been another episode of the State of Medtech. We'll see you all later. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.